we're updated now. We're going to do a little bit of queer theory and we're going to do it with the visuals that you ask for. So what you should see on your screen is both me speaking, but also the screen itself. I want to go through some of the documents and things that we've got. So this is Catherine D. Harris for English 101 and we're doing a little mini lecture on queer theory and criticism. So queer theory really builds on feminist theory, gender theory, and then gay and lesbian studies as well. And I want to go through some of those definitions. Some of the key terms you need to listen for are homosexual, homosocial, sexuality, gender, which is masculinity and femininity from before, socially constructed, culturally constructed. So queer theory is a, a way to move away from the identity of feminist theory that we did before. So queer theory, let's start out with an Oxford English Dictionary search. I just did a small search on the OED, which is the library database. You can see that there are several entries on queer as a noun, adjective, adjective, and noun. But what I've done here is I want you to also see what are the dates. So if we sort by date, you'll see that the use of the word queer was circa 1390 in the first written word. It also comes up in 1513 as an adjective, and then an adjective and a noun in 1567, 1781 as a verb, and 1826 as a noun again. So I want to take a look at the full entry from 1826. So what we see here is where it, it comes up, and it's often seen as derogatory for queer theory and just in general. It's been a colloquial reference, meaning a conversational reference to homosexual or a homosexual man. And you see this 1894 starts this idea of what is queer. So queer has a very specific political value to it. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit of history of queer theory. So this is from Dr. Mary Clages at UC Boulder. She gives a great example of what is queer theory and the history of it. So queer theory really grew out of gay and lesbian studies. Uh, it's relatively new in that it really organizes a form only around the 1980s. It wasn't until about 1991 that it became a widely used critical theory. So it came out of gay and lesbian studies, as I've mentioned before, as a political form for academics. Uh, it challenges the notion of normative sexualities. So when I talk about normative sexualities, things that are acceptable in terms of the mass culture, not just one individual. And this is problematic because as we know, the structures of power are the ones that dictate a lot of what is part of normative, right? So we have to be careful the way things are written to understand what are the power dynamics that are going on. So what happens when you come from gay and lesbian studies and you want to start to take a look at people's sexualities? Well, what happens is a binary that's set up. What is labeled normal automatically and always has the polar opposite of what then is considered deviant. So you have to put those two together and understand in the power hierarchy, just like with deconstruction, that binary of normal and then deviance. So when you do something your culture labels deviant, you're liable to be punished for it. And punishment, it means it becomes a pathology. It becomes a crime. And this can be in the realm of things like being arrested, being shamed, being made to feel dirty, uh, losing a job, uh, your license, access to loved ones, self-respect, or health insurance. So with gay and lesbian studies, like feminist studies, they work to understand how these categories of normal and deviant are constructed. How these categories of normal and deviant operate. How these categories of normal and deviant are enforced. And then gay and lesbian studies, feminist studies, and now queer theory and queer studies operate to intervene into changing or ending these kinds of constructions of deviant and normal. First, you identify what's considered deviant and normal in a piece of literature, and then you see how it's ambiguous or undermined or complicated. All right. 
I'm being a little reductive here about these two binaries, but as we know from studying Heart of Darkness, there is ambiguity in the written word all over the place. So queer theory and emerging from gay and lesbian studies, attention to the social construction of categories of normative and deviant behavior, benefits by being able to uh, render a political critique of anything that falls into normative and deviant categories, specifically sexual activities and identities. So we're still working through identity. We did that with feminist and gender, and now we're doing it with queer theory. So the dictionary definition, as we can see in early definitions of queer theory from the OED, really has to do with odd. That's number two here. Odd, peculiar, or eccentric, or outside what is considered cultural norms outside normative behavior. So we graft that onto sexuality, especially at the end of the uh, 19th century with Oscar Wilde in literature. And we start to ask ourselves, well, what here is being articulated as normative and deviant? And it can be in the behavior, in the sexuality, in the expression of desire. And with queer theory, we're looking at it between two or hom two homogenous sexes. So identifying man to man or woman to woman. So that means we're looking at the representation of people's actions or characters in literature as being either normative or deviant based on how they express themselves to other characters. <coughs> okay, so queer theory concerns itself with any and all forms of sexuality that are deemed queer in this sense, and then by extension with the normative behaviors and identities which define what is queer by being their binary opposites. So what I mean is that every time somebody says, there, there'll never be a character that says this is the normal, just by articulating and behaving in a certain way, that represents what is considered the normal cultural behavior or the normative cultural behavior in the context of a piece of literature. In literature we get the benefit of hearing a lot about the characters and seeing their psychology and the way that they interact with other characters. So we can start to interpret their sexuality, their representation of deviance, their representation of normative. So keep those in mind if we, as we keep going along. Deviant and normative, right? So queer theory expands its ideas and analysis to think about all kinds of behaviors, including those which are gender bending, as well as those which involve queer, non-normative forms of sexuality. So that means that we can pull in this idea of what is drag queens, transgender, and cross-dressing. Not labeling them deviant, but trying to understand how that binary is set up of normative and deviant in a piece of literature or a text. Queer theory insists that all sexual behaviors all concepts linking sexual behaviors to sexual identities and all categories of normative and deviant sexualities are social constructs. They are a set of signifiers which create certain types of social meaning. So remember from semiotics we have the signified and the signifier. So that means that the language shifts according to what the other words are around it. So let's keep this in mind. And let's go back to the screen of the Google Ingram viewer. So I don't think I've shown this to you yet, but I wanted to show you a list. It's basically all the books that Google Books has scanned. They ceased doing this probably around 2015. They were not just doing books, they were doing periodicals and all kinds of texts. It wasn't just fiction. So I looked at the corpus of 1500 to 2019 for the years, the representation of the word queer. And I used American English, the corpus from 2012, because I wanted to see where queer is being used. I clicked case insensitive. Now we see the representation of queer 
topping out in 1649. Okay, that gives us some figure. We have some things to take a look at. Why would queer be used at that particular moment and in what writings? And then it drops back down to where we have just a little bit of reference to it. It peaks back up here in 1784. And then once we start getting to the 19th century, American and British literature start using this idea of queer to represent identity and sexuality. So then we see it peaks out up here at 1923. If you're ever curious about why it does and you want to read where it starts to appear, if you scroll down, you see that we have different um, clusters of text that Google Books will bring up. So if we clicked on 1925 to 1934, Google Books brings us the actual documents that have the word queer in them. And you see, it just finds queer, just the word itself, not the concept. So you start looking at how five queer women on page 138 of this, Five Queer Women is a novel, it looks like, from 1929. If we wanted to take a look at earlier on, we might look at 1783 to 1924 and then see what comes up from there. Queer Pets and Their Doings in 1885. So that, I think, does not represent identity and sexuality. It's more in line with the odd or the strange or the eccentric. But my question is, even with this, who is defining what is eccentric? When somebody tells you that's odd, what is the normative baseline that they are operating from in order to qualify some behavior or something as being odd? You always have to under uh, investigate what's that underlying social representation of what is normative behavior, sexual identity. All right. So if we take a look at, at this idea of normative and deviant sexualities as being social constructs, then that means that we go back to semiotics and look at all the words that are surrounding it. So what we want to look at in, in terms of thinking about queer theory is that we want to reject this idea that sexuality is attached to our biology, to our genitalia, that it's prescribed when we are born. So queer theory takes up this, that, that, that biology and external, external standards of morality and truth do not dictate sexuality. So this is something called essentialism. And essentialism uh, it, theory is a way, if you look at somebody walking down the street and it's a woman uh, and you just assume that she's dressed like a woman, she has the shape of a woman, she seems to have the biology of a woman, and therefore assuming that she's going to behave in the fashion that that culture expects a woman to behave. So it's attaching behavior and sexuality to your actual body. And queer theory does not want to do that. They do not want to dictate sexuality based on biology or essentialism. Right. So that gets us back to politicizing it and taking a look at who has what rights in queer theory. So with queer theory, we can take a look at that social construct of politics, economy, um, psychology. And one of the things that we need to think about with queer theory, it's brought up by this scholar named Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, who is part of our Johns Hopkins readings. Sedgwick comes up with this idea, especially based on literature in the 19th century, that there is something that's beyond just queer theory when we're looking at queer theory, queer not being used as a word to identify sexuality before about 1890 when it became pathologized, meaning it became something negative or an illness or a sickness in normative culture. Right? I'm not saying that it's right that it was done this way. I'm giving you a history of it. So Sedgwick said that what she found in studying literature in the 19th century was that she often found that there was something called homosocial bonds among men. And it wasn't veering into homosexuality. There wasn't a sexual act or it wasn't a declaration of sexual identity for homosexuality, but it was a close male bond that could not be broken or intervened with by any woman. And in fact, she said what usually happens with this literature and these characters is that there will be a triangle. There will be one man, one woman, and then another man. And the woman is there in order to intervene so it doesn't go from homosocial to homosexual.
And it's not that it's overt in literature, it's that it becomes something that we can tease out as queer theorists. So what's the praxis? Meaning, how do we use this thing? So how we use it? The first thing that we want to do in being able to identify what is normative and what is considered deviant in, in the context of the literature that you're reading, or now we can do movies and anything else, tweets all the way out there. Then we start to look at what is the homosocial desire or relationship that's being set up, or and is there a homosexual desire that is expressed? It has to be expressed through the words. It might not be overt. This is where we get to use our psychoanalysis and semiotics. So in this homosexual desire, is there a repression of that desire? By whom or what? What are the representations of this homosexual desire? You're looking for the desire. We're also looking for an erasure or an eliding of gender binaries. Eliding meanings slipping through. What gender binaries are being articulated, masculine, feminine, and how are these being undermined in terms of the power structure, but also being very strict in that this is masculine and this is feminine. Hmm. Semiotics would allow us to work around that and see how that is re-articulated and redefined throughout, for instance, say, a novel. So it's the same thing with this one. Is there an erasure or an alighting of sexual binaries? Male, female as sexual binaries. So this could be sexuality, but this is, could also be biology in terms of sex. Okay. Is there a performance of gender or sexuality? So we're going back to our gender theory. Do we have a performance of a sexuality? And this is where a lot of you already said, you've been watching the RuPaul drag show. So I want to ask you that question of where do you see gender or sexuality being performed in that way? Is it a critique, a celebration, a combination of the two? All right. So one thing I wanna go back over to for today was trying to take a look at one other element that I had open here. Wikipedia has a definition for queer, not queer theory, just queer. And one of the things that I want you to note about Wikipedia that's really important, they have the article, which you can click on here, that's usually what the results that are retrieved, but then they also have a talk page in all Wikipedia entries. The talk page is where decisions are made about the entry itself. So queer as a concept has evolved over the last 35 and 40 years. So it's pathologized still, but at the same time in U.S. culture, it's not the same as it was in the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s in terms of what's considered deviant and what is considered normative. Okay. So I want you to think about that and how that gets reflected in culture and literature that you're reading from maybe your other classes that deal with 20th century literature. How has the representation of queer shifted or changed? So you can see from here that there is a widespread debate on Wikipedia about how to represent the concept of queer. And there's all of these things up front to say it's part of these other concepts. And you'll see here uh, it's also part of these other projects. There's a ranking on each of them that gives a ranking for the quality of the entry that's part of this. And these are all B and then B top and B and B low, meaning that they need more work on them from the editors. So you see these senses of the word here. It's, it's senses of the word is a discussion about it, and it's a discussion about the OED, which we just looked at. And what's the problem with articulating the OED as a source to define queer? Queer flag is another one. Description of the terms needs to be rephrased. So I show you this because I want you to understand that the words change and shift which with each year, with each decade. So Wikipedia tries to keep up with that, but it's citizen um, journalists and citizen editors who are responsible for this. I also show you this because as you take your literature classes and you go from one decade to the next and one period to the next, you're going to see shifting concepts. And I think queer theory and 
This concept of what is queer has changed and shifted throughout all of our U.S. history and culture. So I just want to be clear, I'm talking about U.S. history and culture. And then we get into regional aspects of the representation of queer, even within urban cities. So New York City has the village, which is known for being... Um, a haven for the queer community. And that's uh, that's not necessarily any more to be a safe space, but it's a space where a community can gather together. The other thing that I want to you want to articulate is that we're growing the language that we use in terms of queer theory. And we're going to ultimately grow it in literary theory as well. So you see that here there's a, a representation extending the definition of queer to using this idea of what is called cisgendered. It's a way to articulate more than one gender and more than one sexuality. And that is in all the literature that's being produced in the 20th century and it's very uh, overt. So I recommend that you take a look at this talk page and see what people are saying. One thing that I want to stress is the terminology that you use keep control of it. Remember, you can't just say that's a male and that's a female because that is an adjective to represent something else afterwards. What do you mean? It's a female dog or it's a male dog. So it's the same with uh, ideas about sexuality. All right. My final note here. One thing about queer theory, one assumption about queer theory is that the, the larger world assumes everybody else in it is heterosexual. And that is a concept called heteronormativity. And unless you're in one of these other groups that are not part of heterosexuality, then you become relegated to being the other or being um, not, do not part of the dominant power structure, right? That's shifting and changing in po politics and US culture. But here's the idea, when you read a novel most of the time, or a piece of literature, without even knowing it, you're looking for something to relate to with the character or the speaker that you're reading. Right? You catch yourself doing this all the time. So that means you're looking for examples of yourself so that you can figure out ways that you can see yourself in the literature. It's, it sounds a little repressive, but everybody does this. So I want you to think about when you come upon a piece of literature, what is it that you define as normative and deviant, meaning just one or the other, just that baseline. And is it is it because you understand yourself as only being in that one world and not in the other world? So when you look at these characters, same way you would walk into a party, you walk into a party and you assume everybody else there is already like you, unless they've, they've got identity markers on their body. <clears throat> and that would be race theory, which we'll get to in next week. So then that means if you walk into a party and you're heterosexual, you automatically assume that everybody in the party is also heterosexual. Used to be that way. So that means that there is an assumption about heteronormativity. And that's a key word that we need to understand, especially when we're reading literature that's historical, like from the 19th century in the modernist period, like Heart of Darkness. So heteronormativity is your final key concept for today. All right, that's it for today. Let's see if this works.